I'm Noel Latif, President of the Foreign Policy Association, and I am pleased to welcome you to this centennial lecture with Dr. Dambiza Moyo. Dr. Moyo, as you all know, is a celebrated public intellectual, an international economist, and a best-selling author. She currently serves on the boards of many multinational corporations, including Barclays Bank, Barrick Gold, Chevron Corporation, and Seagate Technology. She worked for many years at Goldman Sachs and at the World Bank. Dr. Moyo has written three New York Times best-selling books, Winner Takes All, China's Race for Resources and What It Means for the World, How the West Was Lost, 50 Years of Economic Folly, and Dead Aid, Why Aid is Not Working and How There is a Better Way for Africa. She's about to release a new book entitled Edge of Chaos, Why Democracy is Failing to Deliver Economic Growth and How to Fix It. Very important, and how to fix it. Dr. Moyo holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry and an MBA, both from American University, a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and a doctorate in economics from Oxford University. Her topic this evening, Is Democracy Dead? Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dambisa Moyo. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm delighted to be here this evening. And um, I should say that uh, it's often very odd to be sitting in an a, a, uh, audience when someone's introducing you because it sounds like you're attending your own funeral. But <laughs> in any case, I am thrilled to be here, and thank you so much for the kind introduction. And thank you also to the Foreign Policy Association for the opportunity to share my views at this fascinating political moment. But it's more than fascinating, of course. It's deeply consequential. What happens in the months and the years to come will have a dramatic impact on the course of history, political, economic, and social. And so I would like to pose perhaps what I think is the most important question of our day. Is democracy dying? Earlier this year, I attended a conference which was full of economists, technologists, medical researchers, and policy experts, where the host conducted an informal kitchen sink, tabletop kind of survey on this very question. By a show of hands, 85% of those in attendance thought that the answer was yes, indicating a worry that democracy is indeed dying. Upon reflection, there are at least four reasons why democracy appears to be under siege. First, there is ample evidence that freedom, a key pillar of democratic efficacy, is declining. According to Freedom House, a nonprofit that conducts research on democracy and political freedom, 2016 marked the 11th consecutive year that freedoms have declined around the world. Meanwhile, over the last decade, 109 countries have seen a net decline in political rights and civil liberties. Only 60 countries have seen a net increase. And while there are far more democracies today in the world than ever before, Freedom House categorizes the vast majority of democracies, around 70% of them, as e-liberal democracies, where citizens enjoy fewer freedoms, and in many cases where these citizens are living in democracies that are indistinguishable from authoritarian states. A second reason 
democracy appears to be under siege is the faltering of democratic institutions. Specifically, in the United States, there is mounting angst that the veracity of the three branches of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, are deteriorating. With respect to the executive branch, for example, over the past several presidential administrations, the power consolidated in the hands of the commander of chief has grown largely unchecked by the other branches of government. Specifically, the last past three presidents in the United States have all unilaterally enacted sweeping executive orders circumventing the legislative process and even waging wars all on their own authority. According to Lincoln Kaplan, a senior research scholar at Yale Law School, I quote, whether from Bill Clinton's executive initiatives in the face of the Republican control of both houses, George W. Bush's wartime assertions of authority, or other actions, the power concentrated in the White House has expanded in every administration since Franklin D. Roosevelt's. Meanwhile, the legislative branch has become so crippled by gridlock and partisanship that even when the presidency and Congress are controlled by the same party, the system struggles to pass urgent and critical policy reforms. A recent example of this is, of course, the failure of the Trump administration and the Republican majority in Congress to pass health care legislation. But this trend extends back for decades, as evidenced by the six shutdowns of the federal government from 1981 to today. There is a worrying sense that government shutdowns are happening with increasing regularity, an indication of mounting political dysfunction. Finally, systemic imbalances in the judicial branch have led many Americans to believe that there are essentially two criminal justice systems, one for the rich and white and another for poor minorities, who make up a wildly disproportionate percentage of the incarcerated population, which today stands at more than 2.3 million people. There is a deep concern that minority populations do more time for the same crime. The distrust of the judicial system, especially by the poor and people of color, has eroded trust in government itself, making citizens cynical about the fairness of the democratic process, thereby undermining its efficacy. These disturbing trends may help explain why the Economist Intelligence Unit, which assesses condition of the conditions of democracies around the world, last year downgraded the United States from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. In addition to the empirical evidence on freedom and the evidence of the decline in the preeminence of democratic institutions, a third source of concern about the, the sanctity of democracy is that democratic values and principles are being degraded by today's noxious political culture and the flouting of values by elected officials. In the nascent Trump administration alone, the failures of this smell test are legion. In just 10 short months, President Trump has fired the FBI director for seemingly political reasons, engaged in what many view as an unabashed nepotism and profiteering, and has even talked openly of pardoning himself and his family members should they be indicted by the special, special prosecutor uh, appointed to investigate the campaign's alleged collusion with Russia. Meanwhile, the tone around the fourth estate, the media, has also eroded. There is a sense that the news media is no longer the font of objective information required for the flourishing democracy. Media consumption patterns have changed markedly during the rise of social media as audiences have become more fragmented. And the proliferation of fake news has poisoned, poisoned the democratic well, rendering voters less able to make quality decisions based on objective information. 
When taken together, these shifts have fundamentally changed the way in which public officials are held accountable to citizens. Of course, it must be noted that all of these numerous and distressing concerns about the state of democracy, particularly in the United States, are strenuously countered by some observers who believe that the claims that the end of democracy is nigh are premature. They would, for example, point out that the fact that the Founding Fathers purposefully devised American democracy to be combative, but resilient in the face of a multitude of political stresses. Indeed, one cannot deny that the democratic system they created has survived countless threats to its stability for over 250 tumultuous years, from the American Civil War to the Great Depression, to two world wars and Watergate. In this sense, democracy is not a static equilibrium, but instead dynamic and resilient. Also, historically, democracies around the world have been resilient in the face of direct and indirect challenges from other political systems, such as communist and dictatorial regimes. And furthermore, the tone and the tenor of the Trump administration is not so anomalous when one considers other, even more rancorous moments in American political history. As Kevin Baker noted in the June 2017 article in the New Republic, there are many similarities between Donald Trump and Andrew Jackson, who was the US president from 1829 to 1837. They both championed the white working class, expressed disdain for the elite, and defied the courts and Congress. And it must be noted that political violence is not so far off in the rear view mirror of the United States history. In just the 1970s, four students were murdered by the Ohio National Guard at Kent State University during a nonviolent protest of the Vietnam War. At the very least, one cannot yet rule out the argument that contemporary threats to democracy are merely circumstantial and personality-driven vulnerabilities, as opposed to more dangerous structural ones. But here is where I pivot. Indeed, there is a fourth threat to democracy, a structural threat that I would like to argue today. The economic assault on the American middle class, and how its decline could very well spell the demise of the democratic system as we know it today in the United States, the vanguard of democracy for more than two centuries. To do so, let me first establish why a sizable middle class is vital for a functioning democracy. Then I will examine why and in what ways the American middle class is in peril and how in this ter in turn endangers democracy. Finally, I will turn to what it is that we can do to solve this urgent existential crisis and what could be at stake if we don't do anything. The veracity and the very survival of democracy depends on a strong, prosperous middle class that is able to hold its government accountable. According to research by NYU's Adam Shavorsky, a country's per capita income and the vitality of a democracy are inextricably linked. Shavorsky posits that in countries where the per capita income is below $1,000 a year, the life expectancy for democracy is only around 12 years. In such instances, it is not unheard of for governments to be overthrown in military, in military coups. When the per capita income in a country is between $1,000 and $3,000 per year, democracy can survive for 27 years. And Przeworski has shown that a democracy will survive come hell or high water when a nation's average per capita income is above $6,000. The link between per capita income and democratic survival is at its very core an intuitive one. Here we're suggesting that at the heart of democracy is an economic contract between citizens who agree to pay taxes on the one hand and the government 
who in exchange for those taxes safeguards the security and welfare of the nation by providing public goods such as education, health care, infrastructure, and national security. If the government fails to uphold its side of this economic contract, taxpayers in the democratic system have the right and the ability to remove their elected officials from office. The majority can simply vote them out and replace them with new leaders. Indeed, this was the organizing principle of the American Revolution captured by that great rallying cry at the Boston Tea Party in 1773, no taxation without representation. In other words, the enforcement mechanism for the democratic contract is the right and ability of every citizen to cast a vote. It follows then that anything that impinges upon that right undermines the legitimacy of the contract and therefore the democratic society itself. In this way, an erosion of the middle class moves us away from full majority, full voting, and necessarily leads us to the, voting, the erosion of democracy. Consider, for instance, how participation rates of voters is strongly correlated to income levels. According to the US Census Bureau, fewer than half, fewer than 50% of eligible adults with family incomes of less than 20,000 voted in the 2012 presidential election. Whereas voter participation among households with incomes of more than $75,000 per annum was 77%. In the 2014 midterm elections, the think tank Demos reports that 68.5% of people in households earning less than $30,000 per year did not vote. I just repeat that. 68.5% of people in households earning less than $30,000 per year did not vote. In fact, and this is a crucial point, for the past 40 years, Poor voters have never turned out at higher rates than wealthy voters for a national election. It is not difficult to understand this troubling dynamic. People struggling to make ends meet are less likely to have the time or resources to spend hours in line waiting to cast their vote. The poor and disaffected might also reasonably feel that there is no sense in participating in the democratic process. This, of course, undermines the bedrock democratic principle of one person, one vote. Over time, inadvertently, it also moves society towards minority rule, with mere pluralities of citizens determining public policy and the direction of the nation. Of course, wealthy citizens are perhaps content to live in a pseudo or non-democratic society, as long as they are able to maintain their personal wealth and policy and political influence. But the same cannot be said of the vast collective of the middle class citizens. For the middle class, democracy is in essence an insurance policy. The premium or the amount that they pay for that insurance policy is that they forfeit and the social and economic constraints of democratic society are imposed on them. For example, the rule of law, taxation, and representative government. The benefit of this insurance policy is the possibility for the advancement, the possibility of future generations to live better lives. Indeed, as long as the expected gains from democracy are bigger than the expected costs from democracy, the collective middle class is content with the democratic system. If this equation reverses, however, if the expected gains from democracy, by that I mean the benefits or the prospects of long-term improvements in living standards, are less than the expected costs, the constraints that we feel today, the middle class will defect from the democratic system. 
Inasmuch as the equation has begun to turn, this explains the decline in political participation rates and the worsening of attitudes in the United States towards democratic institutions. This, ladies and gentlemen, is where politics and economics intersect. Wherever the middle class is sufficiently weak that it cannot hold politicians accountable, those politicians become dependent upon and loyal to a wealthy elite minority. As the middle class deteriorates, the wealthy gain more and more political influence, while most everyone else finds it harder to exercise their political power. Economic deterioration, therefore, becomes an impediment to democracy itself. The result is a vicious cycle that renders the middle class increasingly powerless. And this gap in wealth and power can have devastating ripple effects. When a disproportionate percentage of a politician's votes and campaign contributions come from the wealthy, the government becomes even more likely to implement policies that benefit the wealthy at the expense of the middle class. This dynamic therefore becomes entrenched and democracy itself becomes endangered. With that being said, let us now consider the state of the middle class in the United States today. It is true that today per capita income in the United States stands at a roughly $56,000 well above the Przeworski threshold that I mentioned earlier for the long-term survival of democracy, even when that threshold is adjusted for inflation. And yet the American middle class is deteriorating at a worrying pace, adversely affecting economic living standards as well as the prospects for a viable American democracy. There is an unmistakable and deeply disturbing progression towards Przeworski's threshold for democratic survival, as evidenced in part by the fact that many would-be voters in the American population are vanishing. According to the Pew Research Center, in 1971, 61% of American families were in the middle class, while 25% were considered lower middle class or poor, and just 14% were considered upper middle class or wealthy. By 2015, the middle class had shrunk to just under 50% of the US population. Meanwhile, the share of the population that is lower middle class or poor had increased to 29%, and the share of upper middle class and wealthy families had increased to 21% of the population. Economic data paints a clear picture of this hollowing out of the middle class. Real wages for middle class jobs have been stagnating or declining for the past 40 years. According to the US Department of Agriculture, in 2015, roughly one in eight American households, one in eight American households experienced hunger. And a 2016 Federal Reserve report found that nearly 50% of all Americans would have to sell personal possessions or go into debt in order to cover a $400 surprise expense, such as a e medical emergency. The situation will only worsen in coming years, given the pace of technological change. A 2013 study by Dr. Michael Osborne and Dr. Carl Frey from Oxford Martin School predicts that as many as 47% of all jobs in the United States could be lost to automation in the next 20 years. And of course, the fact that income inequality has widened over the past several decades, particularly in the United States and social mobility has declined, it is also a manifestation of the hollowing out of the middle class. Specifically, widening income inequality has two pernicious effects that strike at the heart of democracy. First, income inequality creates political income inequality, effectively dividing society into two classes of citizens. 
One of the most shocking indicators of income inequality in America today is the fact that the 20 richest people in the United States control more wealth than the bottom 152 million people. That's the bottom half of the US population. In 2016, for example, 50% of all financial contributions to political campaigns in the United States came from just 158 families. I'd just like to repeat that. In 2016, 50% of all financial contributions to political campaigns in the United States came from just 158 families. And not only do the rich control more wealth than ever before, it has also become easier for them to use that wealth to influence politics. Thanks to the Supreme Court's landmark Citizens Uni United decision, wealthy Americans can make unlimited contributions to political action committees. Far from one person, one vote, this system effectively allows the wealthy to buy political influence that the middle class simply cannot afford. This magnifies the influence of the rich on politics and public policy, precisely when the number of people in the United States middle class is deteriorating. Furthermore, it dilutes their voting power and undermines the core democratic principle of majority rule. To see the effects of this outsized influence, one need only look at the ideological views of our elected representatives. In 2015, Michael Barber of Brigham Young University surveyed the ideological views of US senators and compared them to the views of two groups. So US senators versus voters and US senators versus their donors. He found that Democratic senators had views that were significantly to the left of their voters, while Republican senators' views seemed even further to the right of their voters. However, the views of both Republican and Democratic senators lined up almost perfectly with those of their donors, a clear demonstration of where the real political power lies. But there is also a second, more subtle effect of the widening of income inequality. As the gap between rich and poor grows larger, it undermines the empathy needed to bind together citizens from different walks of life in a vibrant democratic society. For generations, the notion of the American dream has been the expression of this empathy. Despite one's class, color, or creed, Americans have been united in the belief that every citizen has the ability to do better and improve their lot in life. However, as income inequality has widened and as political inequality has widened along with it, this unifying dream is dying. There is now an understandable sense that the rich gain unfairly through a rigged system while the poor prey on a grossly unsustainable welfare state. These two classes of citizens lack empathy for each other, which foments skepticism in democratic political life and leads to polarization, isolation, and even extremism. It is quite alarming to see this dynamic playing out in contemporary politics. At the height of the 2016 presidential campaign, for instance, the Pew Research Center reported that views of the opposing parties are now more negative than at any other point in the last quarter of a century. Against this backdrop of mistrust, extreme political views fester and grow, while politicians themselves cater to an ever smaller, ever smaller slice of the electorate and public policy, no longer reflecting the wills of the increasingly politically powerless majority. The end point is potentially calamitous, with economic disintegration leading to political, social, and cultural disintegration. In other words, the collapse of a functioning democratic society, the rise of, of authoritarianism and dictatorship, and even, God forbid, civil war. Clearly, economic prosperity is vital to the survival of a democracy, 
A strong, broad-based middle class is what holds democratic governments accountable and creates political and social cohesion. Without it, it's no surprise that democratic society will decline. The bottom line is this. The decline of the middle class in the United States is a political crisis masquerading as an economic crisis. The solutions to this crisis, therefore, must also be political. Of course, democracy does not die overnight. It dies slowly as the middle class atrophies and gaps in income and political power widen to the point that they rend society apart. Indeed, the process is so gradual that we hardly notice it until we look back and take stock of how much things have changed. 25 years ago, Francis Fukuyama published his celebrated opus, The End of History, and the last man. In it, he argued that Western democracy was in the final form of human government, that all nations would eventually adopt democratic systems, and that would mark the end of our political evolution as a species. In the 1990s, the Soviet Union fell, catalyzed by the momentum of democracy in Glasnost and Perestroika. America was in the midst of an unprecedented peacetime economic expansion and around the world, the momentum toward democracy accelerated. Indeed, from World War II to the early 21st century, the number of democracies around the world skyrocketed from nine in 1945 to 87 in 2009. Today, however, things look quite different. As Joshua Kolancic of the Council on, Foreign uh, Foreign, uh, Count, excuse me, Council on Foreign Relations argued in his 2013 book, Democracy in Retreat, the middle class has embraced authoritarianism, authoritarianism and limits on civil liberties in countries as disparate as Venezuela, Pakistan, Taiwan, Hungary, and the Czech Republic now exist. Meanwhile, some democracies have fallen to military coups while others have been degraded by internal political forces. The result is a net decline in the democratic governance globally. At the same time, illiberal societies and non-representative governments have demonstrated tremendous political and economic stability, from China to Singapore to Fujimori's Peru and Pinochet's Chile. Clearly, democracy is not inevitable. It cannot and will not survive on its own, nor will embracing it mark the end of our political evolution as a species. If the current economic and political momentum pr proves anything, it is that safeguarding democracy requires constant, continual effort from all citizens and all leaders. Democracy is not something that you have, it is something that you do. A labor of love that has lit the world for centuries, but it is not guaranteed for the future. The future of a credible democracy in the United States depends on whether or not we can restore the American middle class, repair the breach between the government and its people, and renew that sacred democratic contract that has allowed this nation and all of humanity to thrive. What is needed to save American democracy, however, goes well beyond economics and the typical economic toolkit of cutting interest rates and boosting spending, and beyond just a viable route towards the middle class. What we are describing is a political problem, and economic solutions are woefully inefficient. Indeed, nothing short of major political reform will avert the calamity. To be sure, there's no silver bullet that will shore up democracy here and around the world. But the end goal of political reform is clear. We must aspire to democratic societies in which all voters cast ballots and in which they are armed with objective knowledge. In such an ideal democracy, public policy will necessarily reflect the will of the majority and will economically benefit a broad base of the public. Anything that moves us toward greater participation and objective knowledge strengthens the middle class. And anything that moves us away from it imperils the democratic project and democracy's chance of standing the test of time. It would be hard for me to understate the magnitude and importance of this challenge, but I would like to end on a hopeful note. 
The torch of liberty is indeed facing gale force winds, and yet perhaps it will not be so easily extinguished. Abraham Lincoln proclaimed in his famous Gettysburg speech during the height of the American Civil War that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Indeed, 154 years later, it has not yet perished. With hard work and good fortune, perhaps it never will. Thank you. Would you like to give your opinion on why the middle class, uh, I mean the lower um, economic bracket is not voting and not participating? I think during the Obama elections that they did uh, come out and vote. Um, but I'd like to hear your opinion. Yes. So thank you for that question. Um, the question is, re is really about what I term to be hope and expectation. Um, part of the problem, and I alluded to it in the speech, is that there are a lot of elements of the American dream, specifically issues around social mobility and the ability for people to work hard and actually improve their lot, that have deteriorated over the last several decades. People do not believe that hard work and education actually lead to better outcomes. And there is absolutely concern around the fact that w many of the challenges that the economy is facing, from debt to income inequality, productivity declines, technology and the jobless underclass, um, those types of issues, pension reform, are well known, but those are all tend to be long-term problems, and yet the debate in the political sphere tends to be very short-term. So what we're facing is a schism or a split between the long-term economic problems and the short-term discourse that we hear coming out of Washington. And I believe that people just feel that this is a system that is fundamentally not addressing the challenges and the concerns of, of the population, and they don't really believe that they have enough um, rope to be able to effect change. We're here. A Ronald Reagan said government is the problem. And since then, uh, government has been weakened and weakened to the point that where we are today. And we have voter suppression, we have gerrymandering, we have public policy that only continues this trend. So how do we change that? What specifically can we do to redirect what's happening, especially in light of the fact that we are facing a, a jobless society, at least in the lower class, lower yes. you know, middle class. So what do we do? So um, I, I, I know it's a bit uh, gauche to plug your own book, but uh, I will... <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I will do that. I have a new book coming out called The Edge of Chaos, which will be out in the spring, which uh, w w was uh, mentioned in the introduction. And in that book, I do specifically uh, provide a, um, a menu of options and what we can actually do. Um, very simplistically, though, for, for purposes here, um, I have separated the proposals into two camps. They're part of them, the majority of them are for politicians. So what can we do to actually improve political outcomes based on what we can do to improve our politicians and representatives? But the other part of it is about what we can do for individual, the voter. What can we do to improve the voter? And I alluded to the fact that the need for objective information um, uh, in particular. The third piece, which is a key pillar of the discussion, is about government. But the truth is that many government, people in government, and that's really the civil service, are, would argue that they're hampered from doing their jobs because of the political environment. So just to give you some examples, a lot of the things, as I mentioned a moment ago, that we're dealing with in the economic sphere are long-term problems. And many public policymakers who are in the civil service 
can tell you and can come up with solutions or what they think is the right path to deal with the debt problem in the United States, for example, or at least come up with some ideas around how to deal with productivity or some of the challenges around technology that we discussed, or of course, even the democratic, uh, excuse me, the demographic shifts that we're encountering. The problem is, a lot of, because a lot of those things are long term, having or superimposing the, the government with a short term imperative, which is what politicians come with, they're facing elections every two years, um, means that you don't have the policies that actually um, are long term beneficial for society. You end up with policies that win elections. And really at the heart of, of uh, my book is really trying to get at ways to bridge this gap between the short-termism um, that we see in, in myopia, we see in, in public policy, and these long-term views of, of government. Um, it's, there's, there are many studies that I could cite. Um, the Millennium Challenge account um, research is very good about the efficacy of government, and it, you know, it may come as a surprise to many people here, the things that actually um, uh, enhance or make government more efficient, efficient have little to do with democracy per se. They have much more to do with meritocracy in the government, um, issues around um, the ability for the, the government to not be in an environment of corruption um, and, and a lot of other things that some, some of them may be a bit obvious, but I think that um, it's certainly the ability for government to be effective is, is more and more about how detached or independent they are from the political process. Uh, in the 2016 elections, uh, the Koch brothers are uh, repetitive, steered about a billion dollars into the elections. <clears throat> um, this because of Citizens United, which opened the floodgates of political contributions, enabling the wealthy to essentially dominate elections. Uh, <clears throat> those motivated by money, uh, Republicans are, are putting more in now than are those dominated by idealism, the Cokes versus people like uh, Storer and so on. Uh, any comment on this, how important that is? To me, that seems to be defeating democracy. Um, so it's interesting. Well, I was... So the, the, the summary question is um, about um, Citizens United and the fact that uh, specifically the gentleman is referred to the Koch brothers and sort of a lot of money being uh, funneled towards um, uh, sort of political, the political process through uh, the, you know, basically the reduction of limitations on how much money a wealthy person can contribute to the electoral process. Um, my, I have to say that uh, in my read of the situation, it's not just on the right-hand side. I don't think it's just Republicans that are, are guilty of, of uh, um, trying to advance their political agenda or their ideological views about uh, the way the U.S. should run. I think that uh, also on the left-hand side, very we know many wealthy people who have been using their um, you know, deep pockets, shall we say, to influence the political process in, in a very legitimate way. Um, but I would say that that, to me, undermines the long-term uh, economic growth prospects, and I think it also undermines democracy, as I alluded to here. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it is, as I mentioned, very legitimate. It's in, within the bounds of the, uh, the Supreme Court decision, and uh, I, I have to say, as someone who was born and raised outside of the United States, um, and, and in that vein, I should say, I, I feel very much like Alexis de Tocqueville kind of coming to visit uh, the United States and trying to learn what's going on in the political process, I do think that it, it seems to me um, that that's a weakness in the democratic process because of, of many of the things that I alluded to. It definitely creates a schism between the haves and have-nots and who's able to influence public policy. I will say, though, that um, there are people who will say, well, if you look at the United States um, public policy agenda pre-Trump, so certainly in the last 10 years before President Trump's election, uh, a lot of the decisions in terms of environmental concerns, in terms of much more, uh, uh, what I, I would say, um, things like uh, diversity, um, a lot of those public policy moves have actually been much more on the left. And, uh, you know, perhaps y there's an, an argument by many people that perhaps the uh, right wing uh, money has not been uh, successful. Um, as one might think, in terms of influencing public policy, um, but th but that is that is one of the arguments. They've got the presidency, the Senate, and Congress. 
So it may change, but I, I think over the last, certainly over the last 10 years, we've had, we, you know, Obamacare came in, we've had, in, you know, signing up to a lot of these treaties, uh, and I think people would say, well, yes, there might be a lot of money going into the public policy, but still we have very, what I'd call very liberal views um, that are being, uh, have been implemented. But of course, we're, we're in the middle of a, a new regime, and a lot of that's being reversed. Question right here in the second row. They said that who got more money? Okay. Okay. So, not always more money makes somebody. Exactly. Yeah. That's, but that's exactly the, the point that I was just making. That actually, if you look at public policy um, the, the, over the past 10 years, barring um, the current administration, public policy does not reflect that money has, uh, has uh, influenced um, politics. A major decline is the loss of manufacturing jobs, particularly in middle America. What is going to be a substitute and change that and resuscitate those jobs? Um, if, you, if, we, if I could give you that answer, I'd be in Tahiti. <laughs> um, so um, so the, I think that there are um, another a number of things I would say to maybe help think about the issue, not necessarily to give you an answer, a prepackaged answer. So at the turn of the last century, 1900, um, around 60% of the American population was involved in agriculture. And today that number is under 2% of the American workforce. Um, and as many of you know, the United States uh, workforce went from agriculture to manufacturing to services. So today about over 80% of the American workforce is involved in services and around 18% in, in manufacturing. Um, the United States has absolutely benefited from there being a, 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 another sector that always emerges to absorb, uh, absorb a large workforce. And you know, increasingly, it's not just about low, low educated workers or lowly skilled workers. Increasingly, the, the face of uh, technology will also impact higher skilled workers that have more routinized jobs. So that is a challenge that we, we do face. Um, one of the things, I do spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and one of the common refrains is just because we don't know what's coming doesn't mean that there isn't something coming that will absorb this uh, workforce. Um, the, in truth, that is not the way public policy operates. We can't all put our feet up and say, well, that's fantastic, something's going to pop up. And that's why there's such a source of uh, deep consternation, because as I mentioned, over 80% of people are in the service sector, uh, working in the service sector. And if we do see the types of um, diminution of jobs that we've seen in manufacturing or indeed in agriculture, um, we, can, we can forecast or be con deeply concerned about what happens to that, uh, that workforce. Um, efforts to retool, there's a fantastic book that just uh, came out called Janesville, um, which shows how complicated it is, it is actually to retool a, uh, a, a small town society. You know, society. Um, you know, a lot of the emphasis on STEM and, uh, and um, sciences, which is what is required in order, really required to get into R&D and, and some of the sciences, uh, scientific innovation uh, areas, I think is, uh, is a big ask. Um, not because people are, are simply incapable, but I think that it does require massive invested in investment in education. And as many of you in this room know, um, on a per capita basis, although the United States is one of the leading countries in a terms of dollar value, um, in terms of uh, outcomes, so if you look at the OECD PISA report, for example, in terms of education outcomes, the United States lags behind um, not just many developed countries, but also many developing countries. And so um, I don't have an answer that's neatly packaged. Um, I, like many economists, I'm desperately concerned about what the world might look like, not just the United States, but globally. There are around 100 million uh, young people between the ages of 18 and 25 who are out of work. And uh, it's, it's becoming, you know, in an optimized wor world, becoming much more challenging, particularly in emerging markets where 60 to 70 percent of the population is under the age of 20. So um, these are acute issues. Um, I could give you many examples. I'll just leave you with one other thought. Uh, if you look at the majority of the states in the United States, um, the majority of young men um, or working, working workforce uh, age um, men uh, are involved in uh, trucking or some form of uh, vehicle, so d delivery trucks, taxis, etc. And the prospect of uh, driverless vehicles um, could severely impact 
on their uh, opportunity of job, job prospects. The question, though, is how does public policy respond? We hope that public policy invests in uh, retooling and reskilling and thinks about new opportunities for people. Um, but um, there is a temptation for public policy for overreach, which I guess you might have been alluding to, um, and you know, taking a, a sort of a much more hardline regulatory stance against these types of innovations, which I don't think is, is a long-term solution. Um, uh, John Maynard Keynes, the British economist in the 1930s, uh, uh, forecasted or predicted that by 2030, which is just a few years away from us now, uh, we would be looking at a 15-hour work week. Um, so many people smile when I say that, but uh, uh, I think, and then the, he obviously, he, he also left us with the question, well, what will people be doing with the, uh, all that spare time? And uh, his answer was, hopefully, you'll be contemplating God um, and not trying to kill each other, so. <laughs> You talked a, a bit about the uh, the gains and the um, I guess losses or costs of of democracy. Could you just expand on and, and perhaps define your terms a little bit more in terms what you about the costs that you view or what you view as the costs of democracy? Yes. Of democracy. Sure. So I mean I think that uh, <laughs> um, a very simplistic way of putting it is that uh, if there weren't any constraints on our behavior. Um, we could be living a sort of Hobbesian uh, life. You know, I might be offended by somebody, and rather than settle it out in court uh, with some kind of a rule of law, I could just you know go out and and, and murder them. God forbid. Um, and there are many other aspects of those costs. So it's not just the rule of law, but it's also the fact that I accept to pay taxes to the government, um, the fact that I believe in a judicial system that is designed to be fair to judge um, uh, you know disagreements, the fact that um, I. I believe in the the legislature so it's about um, the the fact that uh, that public policy does the right thing for the majority I mean all of those are essentially costs for an individual because I could also take the view that uh, you know this property of uh, this amount of land is is mine because I'm sitting on the piece of land but that's not how we operate we all have accepted that there are certain norms and rules that we've agreed to abide by and but those that whole infrastructure, uh, political infrastructure is incredibly delicate because if people start to believe that actually it's not a level playing field and some people are getting unfair advantage, whether it's access to university places, access to jobs, access to, to uh, capital, um, it's those types of uh, unfair uh, standards that I think undermine this, this, uh, our ability or our willingness to, uh, to pay these, uh, these costs, the costs of, of accepting the rule of law, accepting the uh, taxation, and, such, and so on. First of all, thank you so much for your comments. They're really quite illuminating and thank put together an awful lot of interesting information into a whole concise presentation. I'm interested in your comment about objective knowledge and how you see that as one of the um, <clears throat> one of the answers to some of the malaise that's going on right now uh, in our fragmented media world. How do you think something like that could be ach achieved? And also, how you see that would necessarily affect participation in voting? So, um, great question. I think there's sort of two parts I, I think about. So one is, uh, and, I, and I think this lady here mentioned this, uh, civ the idea of a civics lesson. So as a foreigner, when you come to this country, if you are applying for citizenship, you have to take a test. And that's true for any foreigner going to most, you know, most uh, industrialized countries. And I think that there's a lot, of, it, it may seem pretty simplistic, but I think there's a lot of benefit to that because there's a, a better understanding of how the system works. And I think that there there, are, there is scope for people to understand not just how the system works, but really have a better understanding of what's up for debate, whether it's in the area of healthcare or education um, or infrastructure or any of the other deeper public policy issues um, that, that we're dealing with. Um, how do we get to a place of objective knowledge? Um, I don't like to suggest this because I'm not exactly a big fan of big government. Um, I think that there are there is an important debate to be had about efficiency of government, but I and, and I'm not necessarily pro small government just for the sake of it. But um, one of the things that has worked somewhat 
in the European context is to have a national media champion. So in the United Kingdom, for example, they have the BBC. It's not to say that this has also not been vulnerable to some of the, the trends and uh, challenges of uh, the social media and, and different uh, um, new media outlets. But I think conceptually, the idea that uh, as citizens we all pay a certain amount to a national uh, agency or national outlet that is designed to provide clear information without a, a slant or perspective to it, I think is conceptually a good idea. I think it, it's critically important because what you want is um, a population to really understand what the trade-offs are between the, the uh, benefits that we might accrue today, um, so for example, a tax cut, um, versus what that might mean for a burgeoning debt, uh, you know, a de debt for future generations of Americans. And I just don't think that the quality of debate that we have in, a, in a, such a fragmented uh, media environment um, helps that. Oh, so, so oh, sorry, she just asked me to just finish off. She asked, sorry, I beg your pardon. She asked some, how would it affect the participation? Well, I think that it, it may not, I think, so there were two bits to what I think the, uh, the uh, democratic nirvana, if you will. We want everybody to vote, but we want there also to be uh, what I'd call high quality voters. So I, we don't want people voting because they think somebody's pantsuit is great. I mean, we want people to vote because they actually think that the policy, a suite of policies uh, is, is, is very good. So I think that um, the, the, the issue of the media uh, point is much more about, the, uh, about why people are voting as opposed to the quantity of voters. Um, I think that there are a number of proposals that uh, I, I talk about, again, in my book, <laughs> around how to get more people to actually vote. Oh. Hi, thank Hi. you very much for being here and for having us. Um, my question, I'm sorry, is a bit more global. Um, I'm from Egypt, and so you know our relations with America are quite tight. We're very big fans. But in terms of a dying economy, would you say that, so although America is not the number one democracy in the world, um, countries like us look up to America because of you know, its foreign policies, how it relates to us and all that, would you say that the dying democracy in America is also affecting socially, politically, and economically all the countries that look up to it as you know, a model for democracy or a country with whom we have so many relations that could help those countries prosper? Yes. So um, it, it's a fantastic question because the, 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 the reason I focused largely on the U.S. examples is because it's critically important that the U.S. get it right. If the U.S. gets it wrong, um, there's so many other countries around the world that are on shaky ground. It's very hard, even for myself and my little microcosm of the world, to travel around the world. And I've been very fortunate. I've traveled to over 80 countries to spend time with business people and public policy uh, academics and politicians and try to convince them that democracy and market capitalism are still worth betting on and that these tools or these uh, uh, ideologies are the best, uh, you know, and, and should be the ones that we should pursue. And that, that really means that the U.S. has to get it right. It absolutely has to get it right. And I was struck, um, you know, earlier in the year by a comment around um, sort of the, the, the sort of fact that we've fallen out of love with globalization. And one of the comments that was made, I believe it was Jack Ma, the founder of, uh, of Alibaba, uh, China, from China, um, he, ma he made the point that the United States has benefited considerably from globalization. It's made a lot of money, but unfortunately, the public policy decisions in this country were to take that money and to use it f to fight wars. If that money had actually been redirected into the heartland of the United States to retool or to reinvest, we might have a very different attitude towards um, the idea of, uh, of globalization. That's a small example um, to really sort of paint a broader picture of why it's so important for us to have higher quality debates um, about the, not just the democracy in the context of the United States, but what it actually means for human survival and for uh, you know, the future of the human condition. And I think that we should all care and we should all defend democracy. I, I won't comp uh, repeat uh, Winston Churchill's um, point about it being the best. Um, we, we all tend to have very, very uh, 
uh, sort of critical views about countries that are blatantly non-democratic. Um, North Korea, we have advice for North Korea, we have advice for Cuba, we have advice for China, but where is the advice for democracies? Um, that is what was really the motivation for not just the speech, but also for the book that I've written. Um, and it, it, the, the, the fate of the world, um, certainly in terms of the political realm, um, does absolutely depend on that. Alexis de Tocqueville observed that uh, America was not inherently great. It was great because it was able to correct its mistakes. Absolutely. So hopefully we still have time to do that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Thank you.